Oh, something's happening. There we go. We're so glad that you're here tonight, and we're so glad the microphones are working so that we can hear John preach tonight, for sure. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm waiting for the electric player. Uh, just as Thank soon you, Michael, as we're all up here on stage, Thanks, I had no idea <laughs> that our guitar player walked off. <laughs> Everything's a little wonky tonight, but you know what? We were just talking before we came out here that everybody's got something going on, and it just seems like the devil is coming from every side. And, man, it just happened while we were up here. So, <laughs> But we're just going to go ahead and go on regardless of what the devil's trying to do, right? So let's get our praise and worship on. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that
Hello, 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 there it is. Look at you go in the sound booth. That's, that's Megan, one of our graduates, still coming back, serving the Lord. Well, God is good. I just want to look around the crowd and look at all the beautiful faces tonight. It's so glad to have you guys here. I love you. You guys are awesome. It's good to worship with you tonight. It's good to have our worship team leading us. Such a good job. Praise the Lord. We're, we're very thankful for Crosswood Baptist Church. Uh, uh, Sunday school class, uh, I think it's a Dunlap class or the Wallen class, coming and serving us tonight and cooking food for us, and we just appreciate that. So this is, uh, this is a part of the night where we take a love offering, and I just want to say what that is. We always try to preface this. Uh, we're an outreach ministry, so what do we do? We run after people most run from. We, we are a ministry of a local church. And so every freeway ministry that's affiliated with us is planted with a local church. And so today we have, I think, nine locations in four states and two countries, five states and two countries. Um, and we have eight homes under this, this north side freeway alone. And I think there's, there's like 16 or something homes all over the United States and in South Africa. And, and so what we do is we, we, we reach the heart of reach of the gospel. We go after people most run from, we, we, we invite them to the local church, and then within six months to a year after planting our ministries, we, we open a recovery home connected to that ministry. And so why am I saying that? It's because I want to see you plugged into a local church. And if you're a member of a local church, I ask that you don't replace your church tithe with an offering to this ministry. If you want to give us a, a blessing tonight as a mission, mission offering above your church tithe, uh, we, we support missionaries all over that are preaching the gospel, and uh, you help us feed people, bus people in, and, and it's such a blessing. But, uh, and so your money is going a long way, and we're very, very thankful that you give and you support us. And the most important thing you can do is you can pray. You can pray for the ministry as we continue to grow and, and see lives change. And so I'm going to pray for the offering, and if God has moved you to give and be a blessing, you can do that. If not, that's fine. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God. And, and uh, I'm reminded of the story in the Bible where Jesus is talking about the two people who gave. And he gave a, he gave a, a story of a man who had lots of money. And, and he would make a lot of noise and a lot of attention to himself when he gave his lots of money to the, to the temple. And there was a widow who gave her might. And Jesus said that she gave the better offering. She, she gave what she had from her heart. And so regardless, Lord, I know tonight, whether we're well off or whether we're not, we all, we all have something to give. And the best thing we can give is our lives. You don't want our money, Lord. You don't need money. You want us to trust you. And so, God, I pray that we would trust you. We trust you with our time. We trust you with our talent. We trust you with our treasure. And I pray that you bless every gift, every giver. And those tonight that are just struggling and that maybe they, they can't afford to even give a penny, I pray that you let them know that you got a hold of them, Lord, and you got them right where you want them. And you use them for your glory. So God bless the offering tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I call you maker, you give life an eternal spark, I call you healer, cause you can mend any broken heart, I call you faithful father, cause you finish everything you start, my soul was made to respond.
Satan is attacking us from every side. You know, Michael was talking in the back room that everybody's got something going on right now. Like everyone's got pressure, everyone's got stress, and everyone feels like something bad is happening to them. But one thing that we as Christians can always depend on and always rely on is that we always have Jesus. And he is mercy, and he is grace, and he is love, and he is our defender. And even when we feel alone and when we feel like it's heavy and Satan is attacking us, we feel alone, don't we? And that is when we have to cry out to him. And that is when we have to believe that he is there for us. Even when it feels like that maybe he is far away, that is when we have to believe and that we have to, to be in the word and we have to draw near to him because he is there for us. We have to believe it.
Amen. If you need a Bible, would you raise your hand so we can give you a copy of God's Word to follow along tonight? How's everybody doing? Awesome. I got to go through the fine print, guys, uh, just so everybody kind of knows we're on the same page. Um, we're an outreach ministry, which means we go to the highways and the byways. We still, for 11 years, we've been having vans go all over the city and picking people up from anywhere you'll call us in the city of Springfield, and we'll get you. I don't care if it's from the Waffle House, the Awful House, the Woods. It doesn't matter. We'll come and pick you up, bring you here so you can hear the gospel. But now it's time to preach the word of God. And so if you're not used to a church setting or, or, or a Christian setting and you came and you had your, some of that good, uh, that, that good food that you ate just a minute ago from some beanie weenies or whatever that was. And you're like, I'm going to be up and down. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to do tonight. We're going to chat. We're going to talk on the telephone. No, you're not. Not in here. Amen. We take the word of God serious, and so we're, I'm asking you tonight that if you're the type of person going to draw more attention to yourself than the preaching of the word of God, that you get up and you go wait by the door, and we'll, come, we'll give you a ride home when, we, when, when everybody goes to leave. And you say, that's kind of rude. It's not rude. It's not, what's rude is not respecting the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so if there's people around you who may not be able to pay attention because there's some, I don't know if I got any of my friends in here that got the ADD. That's what I got. But if you're up and down, moving around, doing all that, man, I guarantee there's five people around you can't concentrate on the Word of God because you're distracting them. And so I'm being nice. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just keeping it real. So I'm asking you not to do that, okay? Cool? Awesome. Turn your cell phones off if you would. And if Tyrone calls, you tell Tyrone, call him back. You'll call him right back here in a little bit. I want to make some announcements, some things that are going on. We got my little sheet uh, my announcement sheet so I don't forget. I want you to mark your calendars for March 11th and, and April 8th. And so we're going to have breakfast here. Casey Merrick will have the breakfast here from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And you can find out more about being part of a church community. And so you mark your calendars. Now don't come any Saturday because ain't nobody going to be here for breakfast. You're going to be standing by yourself. March 11th and April 8th, there'll be breakfast. The freeway team will be here from the Sunday school class, and they're going to tell you all about a local church community. We want to get you plugged in. So you may want to write that down, and we'll, we will advertise that. It will be on our Facebook page and just kind of keep continuing. But you want to write that down and keep, keep track of that. March is Missions Month. And so in March, what we'll be doing is, and March is next week, by the way, so we're going to start, we're going to start featuring ministries. Different places where you can be a missionary in the city of Springfield, Missouri. You don't have to be a passport to be, you don't have to have a passport to be a missionary. You can be a missionary right now, right here. And so we always need help with security. We always need help with child care. We need help with transportation. We need help with, we're going to have the shower trailer ministry starting at the end of March. We're going to provide hot showers twice a month. We'll have our shower trailer outside and and uh, to my unsheltered friends or my friends that are having a hard time right now and you may not have been able to have a hot shower in a long time, we got your back. We're going to have showers here. We're going to have three shower, showers in our shower trailer. We're going to share the gospel. We're going to give clean clothes, hygiene, underwear, socks. And every person that gets on that shower will be, will be counseled before they get on. And we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. We need helpers for that. It's going to be here on two Saturdays a month. And then it's going to be here every single Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. We'll have it outside of the building so people in, in the city of Springfield can come and, uh, and have a chance to, to get a hot shower and get loved on. And so save the date also. April 11th will be our annual volunteer banquet. April 11th will be our volunteer banquet. So talk to your team leads. So if you serve here, talk to the person who is in charge of the ministry you're under, and they'll get you signed up for, the, for that. And so we do this every week to be the light. Um, we're going to change this soon enough. Our theme for the volunteer banquet in my word of the year is compassion. I want to be more compassionate 
Jesus was full of compassion, the Bible says. Warren Wiersbe says that compassion is your pain in my heart. And, uh, man, I think that's a beautiful thing, and I need to be more compassionate. And so that's my prayer is that I would be more compassionate, and this ministry would be a compassionate ministry. Uh, so would you do give me the next slide for the, for the eye share, please, if you can? So every single week, we, we're, we got these T-shirts we give away. We don't sell them. And so how do I win a T-shirt? Well, you share a photo on Facebook here, or you can even share the live feed, right? We're live every Saturday night. You check in. There's a little map thing on your Facebook page. You just hit that. You check in at Freeway Ministries, hashtag or pound sign, whatever, your, whatever you call it, one broken life at a time. Share it on your Facebook page. We go through it every week, and we'll find a new one. Listen, the same people share. There's not a lot of new people doing this. Get on the Facebook and do it, okay, so we can give you a free T-shirt. And so this week is Jennifer Williams uh, Holdridge. Holdridge. I'm going to say it wrong, and I apologize. How do I say it? Holdridge? Congratulations. Amen. All right. So if you would turn your Bibles to uh, Acts, if you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we are in 1 Corinthians. We're going verse by verse for the book, through the book of 1 Corinthians. And I, I've just been trying to do this lately just to encourage you that when you come here, we, you will come here and you will hear nothing but the Word of God. Verse by verse through the books of the Bible and my, my goal is to study as hard as I can every single week, pour myself into the Bible, pour myself into the Word of God, give everything I got to study in this book. And then when you come here, I pray that you learn more about the Bible than you did when you came and you leave knowing more about the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, than you did when you came in this building. And so that's my commitment to you. And so I just want to encourage you tonight that we're studying hard to teach you the Word of God because this is what's going to change your life, guys. And so... We don't run from verses. We're going to go verse by verse, and there's going to be some challenges. And tonight, this, 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 this sermon is entitled, The Gift No One Wants. The Gift No One Wants. So if you would stand to honor God's word as it's read. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The word of God says, Now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is, not, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each one have his own wife. And let the woman have her own husband. Let the husband render his wife the affections due her. That word due is very important. I'd circle that. And likewise, also the wife, her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except for a consent, except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not a commandment. For, and, and so he's giving you a preface about what he's about to say. He's saying this is, a, this is a concession, which means an opinion of mine, something I believe. For I wish that all men were even as myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. For this section of scripture that has been a challenge to, to read and study and learn. There's so much in here, Lord. And uh, I just pray, God, that you help me be useful tonight for you. I pray that I would be like a, an old tool, your favorite tool in the tool shed, Lord. You'd use me for your glory. Now, God, I pray for my single friends tonight. I pray, God, that you would minister to them in a special way. I pray for those in here that are codependent. And miserable. Every single time they get wrapped up in a relationship thinking that person is Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And they're going to solve all their problems. And the next thing you know, they're empty, hurt, alone, abused again. And I pray, God, for the Christian tonight. That we would find our contentment 
in Christ. Regardless of our status, whether we're single or we're married. And so God, I'm asking you to do me a favor and help me stay out of your way. And I pray that I would preach like a dying man to a dying people. I need to be bold and brave, and I'm going to need your help for that, Lord. And if there's somebody here lost, I pray that you save them by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you can have a seat. Paul is going to answer a question. In chapter 7, he says, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. It's in quotation marks. So now you'll see, in, in, as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians, he's going to answer a lot of questions that was written to him in a letter. So Paul had, had, had the church write a letter, and they wrote it to him, and they had all these questions to ask. And if you read chapter 16, there's two people whose names are too hard for me to pronounce. They brought Paul the letter. And so now Paul is, is going to start answering questions to the church. And here's the first question in verse 1. Look what it says. He says, now concerning the things you wrote to me, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. So he, he explains that in seven verses and some more. And if you, read, if you read about Paul, Paul's a very unique person. Paul says, my goal is to preach the gospel where it has not been yet. He's a hero, frontline missionary, trailblazer. And so what did he do? He went and he preached the gospel and he would, he would be stoned and beaten and drug out of the, 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 out of the synagogue. But there would be some who would listen to him and hear and he would take those people and he would build them up and disciple them. And he would, he would plant a small church and then that church would grow and he would raise up a leader. And then he would leave and do it again. And this church that Paul's writing to at Corinth, he was there three and a half years with them. Let's understand the culture before we get into the scripture this chapter has 40 verses in it, plus. 40 verses on singleness, marriage, widows, divorce. But you, you deserve to know something before I get into this section of Scripture. And what I'm going to tell you can unlock new truths for you. So I'm going to explain the first century culture and the four types of marriages fast. So I'm going to get nerdy on some people, and you may not like this, but some may like it. I may be the only one. There's four types of marriages in the first century culture that Paul was writing to. The first marriage, was a, the first marriage I'm going to tell you about is a slave marriage. This was, a, this was called tent companionship. So someone would, they didn't have Chase credit cards and they didn't have the banks like they have today. And so, and, and so when someone would get in debt and they would get over debt to somebody, they would have to, if they couldn't pay them back or, the, or they would send them to a debtor's prison to work off the debt or they would just take everything they own plus them. And so I'm not, I'm not agreeing with that, but that's the way it was. And so you've got tent companionship where two slaves get married allowed by the master. And they would let them live in a tent, but the master could take one slave and send them over here, sell them, take another slave, send them over here, make them marry other people. Those people were in the church. And then you have common law marriage. In first century culture, we had common law marriage where someone would live together for a year and they would, they would legally say that they had been married. And then you had arranged marriages. A father could sell his daughter to someone to marry, to make money. And then you have a noble marriage. And a noble marriage was a marriage where we have, we have adopted that noble marriage. Same ring finger, cake, ceremony, families come together. The noble marriage was when a man would, would marry a woman and he would marry her solely to give someone his last name, to leave a legacy, to give someone to inherit his stuff and bear children. But he would show his affection towards his slave women and he would have sex with them and no one was ever judged for that. They were all in the church. So just imagine for a minute, you get saved out of that. You're hearing the gospel. And you're like, what do I do now? And so you write Paul. And you have questions, right? I believe from reading this that there were people in the church that were thinking that it was more spiritual not to have sex than to have sex. 
And so they were asking the question, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? The word touch is a word for sexual relationships. It means sexually intimate. Paul just finished in chapter 6 about the lordship of Christ over your body, uh, addressing uh, immorality, people having sex with prostitutes in the temple as an act of worship. And and, in verse 18, it says in chapter 6, it says, flee sexual immorality. And he talks about you being the temple of God and God purchasing you with a price and you belonging to him, playing Frankenstein with a harlot, basically a prostitute. And then he says, is it good? Is it not good for a man to touch a woman? Interesting. So let's look at this for a minute. I want to look at singleness. What does it mean? What's the gift that nobody wants? The gift most people don't want is the gift of singleness. Is it a gift? How do we know if we have the gift of singleness? And does single make you more or less spiritual than someone who isn't single? So here's some simple take-homes, and I I hope this really ministers to you because relationships are the number one cause for relapse. And I want to encourage my single friends here tonight. I hope this is just special to you and you get this and take this home and this changes your life forever. I want to let you know that singleness is a good gift. Singleness is a good gift. When you think of a spiritual gift, what do you think of? Maybe a speaking gift or discernment or helps or... Or, or maybe even administration, preaching. Do you know there's arguably 18 to 27 spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible? But one that you don't see scholars mention is singleness. But singleness is a spiritual gift, a gift from God. So what do you do with a gift? You use it. <laughs> you use the gift. A spiritual gift is a gift to be used. God gives it... To you, so we can use that for his glory. Look what it says in verse 7. He says, I wish all men were as I am. Paul was single. He says, I wish that all men were as I am. Verse 6 says, this is a concession, not a commandment. He's just saying, this is my personal opinion. I wish you were all like me. But each one has his own gift. One in this manner, one in that manner. What's he talking about? Two things, marriage, singleness. Both are a gift from God. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's various grace. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. It says in Romans 12, chapter 6, marriage is a beautiful gift. Singleness is a beautiful gift. But you can't have the gift of singleness if you are married. Some say, I don't know if I have the gift of singleness. If you're single, you have the gift of singleness right now. Amen? Now you know. If you're single, listen, and you're not burning with lust, and you're not married... You just could have the gift of singleness. Hear me tonight. I believe this is a very rare gift. But I do believe some people have the gift of singleness. And some people live their life content with just a relationship with Jesus Christ. Like Paul, without a spouse. But it doesn't make them more or less spiritual than someone who does have a wife or a husband. Where would we be tonight if everybody had the gift of singleness? We wouldn't be. We wouldn't be here because there wouldn't be any procreation. So I'm very thankful tonight that everybody doesn't have the gift of singleness. Amen? And so here's some simple things to go home with tonight. My single friends, listen to me. Don't waste the gift of singleness. Listen, don't waste it. When I was in a prison cell in 2008... An old missionary man named Dewey Houston wrote me in prison, and I wrote him back for 18 months. You guys, I've told you this story a thousand times. You say, why do you talk about it all the time? Because it's my testimony. You can hide yours under a basket, but I'm sharing mine. 
And he came and picked me up and brought me to Springfield, Missouri, and he gave his life to the Lord. He served the Lord. He is a 70-something-year-old man, never did drugs, and his wife was a 70-something-year-old woman, never did drugs. They were missionaries in Africa, retired, and he, you know what they did with their time? They made cookies, donuts, and coffee, and they went and sat with the drug addicts at the meetings and, and, uh, and had nothing in common with them but Jesus and invited them to their homes. And he raised his kids on the mission field in Africa, and he, they would do homeschool in the back seat while he drove down the rugged roads to preach the gospel and he had a daughter named Becky Houston and Becky Houston was a Muslim missionary and what she did was she trained people who were going on to the Muslim mission field about the culture and the language and taught them everything so they could have a crash course to learn so they could go preach the gospel to Muslim people Becky never gave never got married Dewey Houston died in 2012, and five years later, they called me to go preach his wife's funeral in Kentucky. And I went and preached his wife's funeral in Kentucky, and Becky, who had probably a decade on me, was there at the funeral, still not married, still using her gift for the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. If you're single and you don't burn with lust, you may consider staying that way tonight. If God has given you a gift of singleness, don't waste the gift. Feeling sorry for yourself because you don't have a wife or don't have a husband, use it for God's glory. You have so much time. You have so much freedom. You can do things married people can't do for God's glory. Some of you think you're going to find Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, and you're going to be happy, and everything's going to be great, and, and, but contentment doesn't come from romantic relationships. Amen. Contentment comes with the relationship with Jesus Christ and understanding who you are in him. And I'm just going to tell you like this. You may get mad at me, but you're probably already mad because you're mad about everything. So here's the deal. <laughs> Listen, you need a relationship, some of y'all, like you need a hole in your head. You don't need a relationship because you're going to mess it up again because you're not matured up in Christ. So seek Jesus as your husband. Seek Jesus in your relationship. Men, seek Jesus like you want to seek that wife because he'll never beat on you, mistreat you, beat you, abandon you, forsake you, dog you out, gossip about you. He is faithful. He'll never leave you. He'll never treat you wrong. And so when you seek the Lord Jesus Christ for that relationship, like you seek all those other things, when you become codependent on Jesus, instead of codependent on trying to have somebody to make you feel like somebody, listen, you don't need somebody to be somebody. Jesus can make you somebody. Jesus can do that for you. Be content with him, single person. Do you know how many friends I have that have seen, and I've seen people get married and they find themselves miserable because they made a mistake. And they say, man, I wish I would have waited on on God because now I'm bound in a marriage to this person. And I can't serve the Lord no more like I used to. I can't just go to the hospital and visit my friends. I can't just take off on the mission trip the church wants me to go on. Because now I have another person in my life to think about. You know what verse 40 says in chapter 7? It reads that some people will be happier single. (laughs) If you have the gift of singleness and you get married, you're not going to be happy. You're going to be unhappy. So pray about that. Don't waste the gift of singleness. And I want, the second thing I want to remind you of with the gift of singleness is the gift of singleness has many benef- benefits. Many benefits. Many benefits. Listen, look what it says in verse, chapter 7, verse 32. <clears throat> Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. I'm just going to let that sink in there just for a minute. <laughs> married, did I hear a married man say amen? You better not. You better be quiet. I want you to be free from anxieties. Look what it says. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to please the Lord. But the married man, the married man is anxious about worldly things and how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. 
And the unmarried or our betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord and how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things and how to please her husband. To my single friends tonight, how many anniversaries do you have right now? How many birthdays you got? How many in-law issues you got? How many baby daddy ex-boyfriend problems you got right now? I'm not saying that. Think about it. Hey, if, you're, if you have the gift of singleness, God has called you to be single. You need to just slow down for a minute before you go head first into another crash course mission to mess up another relationship because you're not ready yet. He says that you'll be less anxious if you're single. You don't have as many problems. Marriage is mutual oneness. Just know that. The Bible says the two shall be one flesh. Jesus, uh, Paul was talking about marriage and he was talking about the garden when the consummation of a marriage is a beautiful thing. I hope you're all old, old enough and grown up enough to talk about sex because it's a real spiritual beautiful gift from God. When it's used right. And the Bible says it consummates a marriage. And, and so, so the two being one flesh. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about sexual immorality. And it says it is the most unique sin because the two it, it be, be one flesh. And you're literally joining somebody who doesn't know the Lord to the Lord Jesus Christ because you are his body. And the, the Bible says that every other sin is done outside the body. But this is the most unique sin because it's the only sin that sins against your own body. Because it's mutual oneness. Listen to me tonight. Mutual oneness. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my family. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate waking up to a house full of people to love. An ex-homeless junkie who had nothing to show for his life. I thought, man, am I ever going to have a family? My first year out of prison was a lonely time. All by myself with my son trying to figure out what I was going to do. But now I have people to love me, but it's not without anxiety. I can't do just whatever I want because I have a family to care for. Every major decision I make involves them now. Every time I say yes to you or yes to an event or yes to a good thing, I say no to my family. Now, Mutual oneness. The two shall be one flesh. You know, you really never know somebody till you marry them, amen? <laughs> if you're like me, you married up. When I married my wife, Charlotte, I married up. And she knows, if you're around me very long, you know I love my wife. You know I love her. She got the bad stuff, I got the good stuff in my opinion, amen? <laughs> but guess what I did when I married Charlotte? I inherited all of Charlotte. And when, when Charlotte married me, guess what Charlotte did? She inherited all of me. I got all of Charlotte's baggage. Charlotte got all of my baggage. I got all of Charlotte's family, and Charlotte got all of my family. The two shall be one flesh. I got the blessings. I got the bills. I got the blow-ups. I got the benefits. I got the in-laws. I got the kids. We got the sickness, we got the health, we got the emotions, the fears, the doubts, the anxieties, the phobias, the ups, the downs, the problems, the ex-relationships, the baby's mamas, the baby's daddies, the addictions, and on and on. Because now we are mutually one until death does a part. Does a part. But if you, if, listen, if you have to get to singleness and that's not the person you're supposed to be marrying, guess what? You're going to be miserable. I was talking with my dear brother, Shannon, here on the front row, who happens to be single. Don't you go after him now, ladies. <laughs> How many years have you been going out of this country? Ten. Shannon got saved and ended up coming to Freeway. He was a homeless guy living behind a dumpster, alcoholic. Ended up getting saved, come to Freeway. And, and Shannon said, you know what, I'm going to go to Israel. Street guy. I'm like, he's like, I'm saving my money. Single guy. No kids, no wife. 
I'm going to go to Israel, he said. Somebody tell Tyrone you're going to call him back. He's ever phone's ringing. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to Israel. I said, Shannon, you just don't go to Israel, brother. You know, you just don't go to Israel. Take off without it. He said, no, I'm going to go. Dyed his hair red, white, and blue <laughs> in a mohawk. Freshly saved, got a recovery Bible. Went to Israel so he could go pray to Jesus on Mount Sinai. Got to Israel, baptized himself in the Jordan River. <laughs> Listen. Found out as he hitchhiked in Israel with a red, white, and blue mohawk in a recovery Bible. Listen. <clears throat> he finds out Mount Sinai is not in Israel. Mount Sinai is in Egypt. As he's on the border and they got AK-47s and they're asking him, you can pray to Jesus in your own country. You better get it turned around. And for 10 years, he's went back. Now listen. And he travels the world sharing people, his testimony with people all over. He goes once a year and it's very expensive. But he couldn't do that if he had a wife. I guarantee it. He couldn't do that if he had a family. See, the gift of singleness keeps him to the place where he can take off and he can go do things like that. And I talk to Shannon about that, and I warn Shannon all the time. We have conversations about every girl he talks to pretty much. <laughs> and I'm proud of you, brother, for being faithful to God for these 10 years of your life. And if you have the gift of singleness, you don't even think about it. You just keep doing what you're doing. The second thing is, this is my second point, if you burn with lust, you do not have the gift of singleness. I believe the gift of celibacy or the gift of singleness is a very rare gift because of procreation. And you see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is, it is not good for man to be alone. I do not have the gift of singleness. I will make him a helper for, fit for him. So it's not wrong to, to have the gift of, it's not bad to have the gift of celibacy and it's not bad to have the gift of marriage and, and it's not more spiritual to be married and it's not more spiritual to be single. I'm gonna quote J-Mac. You guys know who J-Mac is? John MacArthur, that's his street name, J-Mac. This is what he says. Although celibacy is, a good, is good for Christians who are married, it is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. It is a gift from God that he does not give to every believer. Just as it's wrong to misuse a gift that we have, it is also wrong to try to use, try to use a gift we do not have. For a person who does not have the gift of celibacy, trying to practice it brings moral and spiritual frustration. For those who have it as a gift, singleness, like all gifts, is a great blessing. Friends, find yourself, if you find yourself burning with lust, don't try to use the gift of singleness. Because you're going to find yourself in a whole lot of trouble. You will fall into sexual sin. You will be sexually frustrated. That does not mean go look for a girlfriend or a boyfriend. That does not mean go to Christian mingle ready to whatever that website is. Stay off of the websites. Listen. So what do I do? I don't, I don't have the gift of singleness. I burn with lust. I need a spouse. Listen, get to the place where you are the type of person you want to marry. Get to the place where you're a disciple believer in Jesus Christ. Get to the place where you know the word of God and you can open up Ephesians 5 and you can show me the role of a husband and the role of a wife and the role as a team. You can, you can, you can be Jesus in the marriage. You got your own place. You got your own job. You got your own car. You got your own church family. You got, you got a ministry to serve in. You're already doing it. You don't need that person to make you feel content because you're content in Jesus Christ and you're running after God as fast as you can and then all of a sudden you look over and there she is running next to you and you say, where you come from? She said, I'm running after God. You say, I'm running after God. Praise the Lord. We're both running after the Lord Jesus Christ together. That's what you do. 
Don't find somebody and try to make them somebody. You be somebody, and that person will be somebody, and you'll be somebody together. Don't be a missionary trying to convert somebody into the guy or girl you want to marry. Be the person. Be content in Jesus Christ. Be mature in Jesus Christ. Prepare your heart so you can be the type of person that God wants you to marry. And if you're out here dating and slick, sleep, slipping around and doing this and that, and you go to your spiritual leadership for everything else, but you're, now you got somebody with you and you ain't told nobody who's your spiritual leadership and you ain't asked for no prayer and you ain't asked for no advice, but you ask for advice on where to park your car, you know you're doing something you ain't supposed to be doing. That, one, that was for free. Thank you very much. <laughs> Some of you may ask me tonight, can you show me in Scripture? Can you show me in Scripture if I burn with lust, I don't have the gift of singleness? Absolutely. I can. Look what it says in verses 6 and 9. It is better to marry than burn with lust. You know where that burn? Here's your nugget tonight. You know what that word burn is? It's, it's the Greek word we get our English word pyro from. It is almost exactly the same word in the Greek, pyro. What's it mean? It means fire, burning, passion, bound up, frustrated. That's what it means. Listen, if you're the type of person that needs companionship, if you have a desire to be intimate and you're walking around frustrated and fixated, you don't have the gift of singleness tonight. So just take that off your list. So talking about sex, it may not be the most popular thing from the pulpit, but any pastor worth his salt will tell you that sex is a beautiful gift from God. It's like fire, pyro, burn. In the fireplace of marriage, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. But you let that coal get outside the fireplace of marriage, and what's it going to do? It's going to destroy everything you have. It will burn your house down, burn your family down, burn your children down. It will burn you down. It must be kept in the fireplace of marriage. So Paul, in this, in this chapter on singleness, these first seven verses in the context of singleness, he explains sex and marriage. And I want you to read between the lines and use your, use your, use your thought here. Paul's asked a question from the church. It, is it not good for to, to have sex with a woman. So why would Paul talk about sex and marriage in the context of is it not good for a man to have sex with a woman when he's talking about singleness? The reason he's doing that is because he's explaining singleness and the usefulness that comes from singleness, but he wants him to know that if you're married, you can't hold out on your husband or wife. Now there's some men in here told me they'd give me 20 bucks if I talked about that to their husband. So I'm I'll be expecting that at the end of the night. Listen, I'm joking. You can laugh. It's okay. We can joke in church. We can joke. It's okay to have a sense of humor. Let, let me tell you something. Listen to me. Listen, we've got to be grown up here. There are people who, who, who claim to be wise and have all this worldly wisdom. You'll know that by the first three chapters of the first Corinthians. And there are people who, who claim to have all these spiritual gifts. And Paul knew there were men in the church who was buying into this first century thought that, 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 that being, 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 being without, not having sex with, your, with anyone, stop, to stop having sex mean I would be closer to God and I would have a better relationship with God and I would be more spiritual. And so Paul is rebuking them and he's telling them basically that is not true. There were men who probably stopped having sex with their wives or wives who had stopped having sex with their husbands. And I want you to know if you're married, I would encourage you tonight that 100% sure you do not have the gift of singleness. If you're married in a marital relationship, right? I'm not talking about separated. I'm talking about in a marriage relationship right now. Remember mutual oneness in the Bible. It speaks of mutual oneness. Paul flips the culture upside down and he says something that no one in the first century would say in Rome. He says husbands don't have authority over their own wives. I guarantee their hair blew back when he said that. Because men were the ultimate authority and wives were third class and treated bad. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You both have authority over each other's bodies. Listen, if you're married tonight 
in a, in a marriage relationship, and I'm not talking about abusive, violent, sinful situations. If you're married and you're holding sex back from your spouse, according to the Apostle Paul, you are stealing from them. You are robbing them and you are ripping them off. You say, how can you say that, preacher? Where's the verse? I'm going to give you the verse right now. Look what it says. It says it right here. It says, don't deprive one another, verse 5. The word deprive is where, we, where they use the, the Greek word of deprived. Is, it means to steal. It means to rob. It means to rip them off. It's the same word used in James from withholding the wages from the laborer. Paul says you cheat them when you do that. Don't be confused with what I'm saying. Marriage is not about just sex. But Paul is teaching He's not teaching so much on marriage, he's teaching on singleness, but he's speaking of a sexual intimacy here. And he's saying that marriage is to be enjoyed, and sexual intimacy is a big part of marriage. He's saying don't hold back from your spouse. Have mutual consent to be intimate together. Look what it says in verse 3. Let the husband render his wife the affection due her. You know what that word due means? It means debt. It means owed. Something that she or he has the right to. You say, preacher, I can't believe you're talking about sex. I'm not talking about sex, Paul is. Tell God about it. I told you we're going verse by verse by verse by verse through the Bible. And here it is in the Bible. And I just want to encourage you, chapter 7, verse 5 says, spiritual people talk about sex. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, don't deprive one another except with a time, a cons- uh, with consent, For a time. What's consent mean? It means we have a conversation about it. It means it's a conversation we have about what? Being intimate. Because intimacy is a spiritual gift from God. God gave me a wife. God fulfilled that desire in my heart. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) The only time uh, it says, according to Scripture, that a married couple will hold off being intimate is if they have a conversation And they fast and they pray and then they come back together because they don't want to be tempted. Why? Because they burn with lust. The Bible says that that, that because of the lack of self-control, because they burn with lust. And so when you hold out from your spouse and and you stop being intimate with your spouse and some of y'all get mad at your spouse and cross your arms and say, you ain't getting none until I get what I want. You just gave the devil a place. Because unity is the most important part in marriage. You say, no, no, in my marriage, when I get in an argument with my spouse, I want to be right. It ain't about being right or wrong. It ain't about that. It's about being unified. So some of y'all just fire your inner lawyer and quit arguing your case. Just work on being unified. And being unified means being intimate. And so if you stop, if you stop being intimate with your spouse and holding out intimacy with your spouse, guess what's going to happen? All of a sudden, somebody's going to compliment her. Or him. Look at man, it's been a long time since my husband complimented me. All of a sudden they're working and the co-worker says, hey, that's a nice dress you got on. All of a sudden, hey, it's been a long time since my husband told me that. How many like eating? You got people like, <laughs> like to eat steak and potatoes. And I'm trying to take care of my health, so I haven't been to a buffet, but I'm a buffet fanatic. I know all the buffets in Springfield. I used to at least, right? And I know you go to the buffet at 11 a.m. because it's hot, it's fresh, and the lunch rush hadn't got there. You get in and you get out of that place, right? And uh, I just want you to think about this. Have you ever been to a buffet before? And, 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 you, and you eat the main course, man, and you, get, you go back and you get your little steak and potatoes and you go over there to that supposed to be Mexican meat, but no telling. It came out of a bag. You don't even know what it is, but you put it on there anyway. You put it on there. And then you got that 25-cent nacho cheese you put on top of everything, right? And then you eat that. And that was after you had a salad. Then you go back and you get a little bit more. And you're full and you're hurt and you're in pain. And you get up to leave. And as you get up to leave, what do you walk past? Somebody say dessert, (laughs) the pie, the cake, the cookies. Who loves the chocolate fountain? You got the chocolate fountain, right? Going everywhere. 
all that stuff that's real bad for you. But you're so full from the steak. You're so full from the, from the main course that you don't even look twice at the pie and the cookies and the chocolate fountains. What a beautiful picture of being sexually satisfied with your husband or wife at home. I'm so full of the steak and the potatoes, I don't even look at the pie at the gym. I don't even look at the cookies walking down the street. I don't mean, hey, listen, I'm looking, I'm looking straight to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm saying, thank you for my wife, Charlotte Stroop. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm full. I'm satisfied. God has given me a wife. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you content tonight? Is there somebody here tonight that you keep looking for a relationship to make you happy because you're not happy? Do you keep thinking, man, if I just find that right person, everything would be all right? And you've been doing that for years. And you've been empty Again and again and again and again. Do you know something? Jesus is that right person. Jesus loves you so much. Listen, he, likes to, he wants to hear from you. He died to hear from you. He is faithful. Listen, the Bible says when we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely will, a, will someone die for a righteous person, but never for an unrighteous person. Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, came and he lived a sinless life and he died on a cross for your sins. And he rose from the grave and it says this, it says he's being patient with you because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants each person to repent and trust in him. You will never have a successful relationship and you will never be content in a relationship until you find your contentment in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Tonight, do you know him? Would you stand? I want to invite the worship team to come, my, the altar workers to come. Maybe you're here tonight. Don't you check out on me. We're going to have a time invitation. Listen up. Maybe you're here tonight, and you need to pray to the Lord. Pray to the Lord about your singleness. Maybe God is speaking to you and telling you tonight you are more free right now than you've ever been and you are about to jump back in to another train wreck what are you thinking maybe there's some tonight that I always tell people give God a date say for a year the next 12 months of my life I will not entertain a relationship but I will focus on my relationship with you alone Lord with you alone I'm giving it a year to focus on you Lord help me be the type of person that I want to marry. Maybe tonight you need to trust Jesus for your contentment. Be thankful you're single, if you're single, and let God use your singleness. Be thankful if you're married, but I'm going to tell you tonight, no matter what, you'll never be content single, and you'll never be content married unless you trust in Jesus as your Savior. The day I fell on my face and gave my life to Jesus Christ was the day that I had the peace of God. I'd never had peace. I was 30 years old. Never had peace. I was empty. I was sexually immoral, running from one relationship to the next relationship, trying to find contentment in women and contentment in money and contentment in drugs and contentment in popularity. And I always found myself empty. But when I met Jesus in a a hot prison cell in Fulton, Missouri, And I surrendered my life to him with no money, no family on the street, nobody to write me, no home plan, wearing state boots, living off $5 a month. I had contentment for the first time in my life. So maybe you're here tonight and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior. We have altar workers here tonight. They want to meet with you. I'm going to give an altar call. And if you need to be content in Jesus, if you don't have the peace of God, young lady, listen to me. Quit chasing men. Chase chase after Jesus. Young man, listen to me. 
Quit looking for women to make you happy. Come meet Jesus Christ tonight, and he'll fulfill every desire of your heart. He'll give you the peace of God. So let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the gift of singleness. I ask, Lord, if there's somebody here lost tonight that they wouldn't hold on to their seat, that they'd come. Now, walking that aisle we know won't save anybody. But God calling on your name, saying, forgive me of my sins in your heart, turning from my sins. I want to trust in you, Jesus. I want to ask that you'll forgive me of my sins and, I, and come into my heart and save me tonight. If somebody would come tonight and just pray that prayer from the heart, turn from their sins and trust in you. Your word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's somebody tonight that needs to be saved. I pray you just touch them right now and let them know it's them. Father, for my single friends that are feeling lonely, feeling sorry for themselves. Maybe tonight you're showing them something special that they need to come and just say, God, I'm yours. I'm not single. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. So God, would you just work through the crowd tonight in a special way? We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, you come. If God is speaking to you tonight, you need to hit this altar, single person. Meet with the Lord and say, God, I want to have my contentment in you. Maybe you're a Christian. You say, I know the Lord Jesus, but I have not been content being single. And tonight, I'm going to get on the my face, and I'm going to ask Jesus to give me that special contentment with him. If you're lost and you don't know the Lord, would you come? If you're a man, find one of these men. If you're a woman, find one of these men, women. As we sing, you respond.
God continues to, to work and God continues to move, I just ask that if God is speaking to you tonight, if God is, if God is moving on your heart, listen, don't let the devil, don't let the devil distract you. Don't, don't let him get in the way. I know it's kind of embarrassing sometimes when you're, you're single. Maybe, you, maybe God is moving on your heart and pride is creeping in on you right now that, uh, that you, you don't want to come because you're afraid somebody's going to know you got problems. We all got problems. I got problems. You got problems. Everybody's got problems. Amen. But if God is convicting you, that conviction is a sweet gift from him. And so I'm asking you tonight, if God is stirring your heart and you need to respond, I'm going to give one more chance before we close out. And if God is speaking to you tonight, maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to surrender something to God. If he's stirring your heart and speaking to you specifically, I wouldn't leave this place without responding to him. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your sweet gift of conviction. We thank you, Lord, that, that you're a good God, that you're not the author of confusion by any means. God, you speak specifically to us in conviction. God, if there's somebody in this room that needs to be saved, as you save them, if there's somebody in this place, Lord, that needs to respond to your sweet conviction, they come and meet with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You were the word at the beginning. What a
All right, thank you so much for being here. You know, if you need any questions, there's still people that are going to be here. Don't leave without getting everything resolved. Guys, if you need a church home, um, talk to the people, or I'm sorry, if you need to get a ride to church tomorrow, talk to the people who are driving you home tonight. They can pick you up for church tomorrow. Pick up any trash.